Democratic presidential hopeful Beto O'Rourke, who hails from Texas, spoke recently on a Virginia radio station. He says if elected, he would rethink border wall construction. There are more than 600 miles of wall and fencing and physical barriers now along that 2,000-mile border. And, and where they are not working, where, in fact, in El Paso, we saw crime actually go up after the wall was constructed instead of coming down, it made us less, not more safe. As an El Pasoan, I, for one, would want to take much of, of that wall down. If there are other places where a physical barrier from the community's perspective is necessary or helpful and it already exists, I would defer to them. And unfortunately, it's not just Republicans who've advocated and voting for building walls here. Democrats voted for the Secure Fence Act that provided the authorization and ultimately the funding to build the walls that we have. And Journalist Todd Miller has authored several books on militarization of America's border walls. He says construction has been as popular under Democrats as Republicans. He adds that Trump has just perfected the call and that the result has undermined the U.S. Constitution. The United States border is probably a lot more expansive than what people might think it is. I assume that most of the people automatically think to think about the U.S. southern border with Mexico, and it's true that it's that, but it's also uh, it also goes up the coast. It's the Canadian, the four thousand mile Canadian border, and it's thicker than than one might think. The border zone is actually a hundred miles inland. So if you think about the U.S. Mexico border and you go 100 miles inland or, and you imagine a band going around, say, the contours of the United States, that is actually the border zone where Border Patrol can operate, where Border Patrol can put up checkpoints, where Border Patrol could, if they are in your area, pull you over and ask you questions. And that's the zone that the ACLU calls a constitution-free zone due to the mangling the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution that protects you from being searched or seized. Former Vice President Biden the other day at the debate, uh, he said that there was not the uh, Obama did not lock people in cages. But you say that, in fact, this goes back 25 years, this militarization of the border. Is that true? When Biden said that during the day, debate, he was he was not. Unfortunately, he was not telling the truth. The Obama administration ha- has been, they locked up people in, in cages. By that, meaning they're in detention when people cross the border, all throughout the Obama administration. And on top of that, no other president has deported more people than President Obama. Almost three million people were deported un- under his administration. Deportations means being deported from the country often, if not highly likely means that you are separated from family members, loved ones. So the separation of families was was very much prevalent, as well as being caged, right? Because in immigration and customs enforcement, detention centers, people uh, spend sometimes years behind bars. So those comments by Biden were not only not true, they obscure something that's been going on, as you just mentioned, for twenty more than 25 years of very prominently in the last 25 years, there's been a, a almost turbocharged buildup of the U.S. border apparatus, and that's in terms of building walls and fences. And there's before Trump ever took office, there were 650 miles of walls and barriers already on the U.S.-Mexico border. There's billions of dollars of technology deployed there. Border Patrol went from 4,000 agents to 21,000 agents. It's the largest federal law enforcement agency in the in the United States. So all these changes have happened over the last 25 years. And it's what Biden and Obama and Trump is a very much a manifestation of a bigger system of border enforcement that's, that began with operations during the Clinton administration, Operation Gatekeeper, Operation Hold the Line, and then was bolstered in the post-9-11 era under the George W. Bush administration, and then really continued and further bolstered by the Obama administration. And now, I would argue that Trump is its finest manifestation. Finest, I mean that in the most sarcastic of senses. You know, that, that, he, that Trump is now a manifestation of what has been building up for the last 25 years. What's behind all this? What's been driving this uh, obsession with uh, guarding the borders? It's actually, as you point out, a very recent phenomenon, this almost obsess- obsession with guarding the borders and making you know, making sure there's enforcement on the borders. And it's almost as if 
there has never been a time when there hasn't been all the Border Patrol agents and all the technologies and, you know, everything that's deployed there now as if it, it's always been there since the beginning of history. It's really a recent thing, like you said. There's many different ways you can look at it. I've, the border issues are complex. But one thing that I've been looking at is the looking at the last 25 years, if you look at the budget, if you look at the budget for border and immigration enforcement in, say, 1994, it was a billion, uh, $1.5 billion dollars. And that was under the Clinton administration when those operations started started to happen. And then if you fast forward to last year, 2018, the border and immigration budget was $23 billion. And that's if you take Customs and Border Protection and Immigration and Customs Enforcement and add them together. $23 billion. So that's been a massive historic increase of budgets. And one of the things that has happened, Customs and Border Protection gave out approximately $27 billion in contracts to private entities, to corporations, to companies like Lockheed Martin, like Boeing, like Northrop Grumman, like the Israeli company Elbit Systems, just to name a few. Those companies also have a lot of clout in Washington. They have, they're able to get behind closed doors of key congressional figures. They're able to get in the House Homeland Security Committee. They're able to get into the Appropriations Committee, the, into offices of members of the Appropriations Committee. And Appropriations, of course, decides who doles out what money to who. That's how budgets are thought up. The sort of influence these companies who are getting contracts also have in Washington, as far as policy is concerned, has to be considered when we're looking at immigration reform, has to be considered when we're even, when we're reckoning with this, the, the most massive immigration and border enforcement regime we've ever had. If there are many profit-making entities involved in anything, it becomes a complex. In and unto itself, it, it will want to grow. And that, and that part of it has to be thought about. Where is this going to go? Right now, if things stay the same, that's, it's just going to continue growing. Companies are going to keep profiting, and there's going to be more and more surveillance technologies, walls, agents, armed agents on the, on the borders. People don't necessarily want that to happen.